Hi, my name is Emily Simons, and I am the women's pastor at The Square Church, and I am so glad that you have joined us in a variety of ways and a variety of places for this first women's event of 2021. This has been way too long since we've gotten to do this. I have missed you. For those of you I haven't met yet, I can't wait to meet you. This has been a hard year that we have faced together and apart. And I am excited that today we are going to use this as a launching point, that we get to intentionally move forward into the rest of this pandemic, whatever it looks like, however long it lasts, with arms linked, literally and figuratively, as we move forward intentionally as a body of believers to love and serve our city. And I believe that the women of our church are crucial to that mission. I am really excited because tonight we have the privilege of hearing from Emily Manginelli. She is one of our lead pastors here at The Square. She is an amazing, wise woman of God, a friend, a mother. She is amazing. And I am excited about the way that she has going to call us, encourage us, and challenge us as a community of women tonight. So I just want to pray for us really quick. Heavenly Father, thank you for um, every woman sitting in every environment right now. Thank you for gathering us safely. I ask for um, protection physically in all ways. I ask for intimacy that goes beyond the meeting of six women who may have never met each other before. I ask for encouragement to be strong in the hearts of women and for friendship to be um, built and to go forth in new and exciting ways from this moment forward. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm just so glad that you were able to come and join us tonight. I hope that you are having fun. I hope that you're feeling seen. I hope that you are eating delicious food, which is one of the most important parts of any gathering and probably just being human. So I hope you're enjoying all of that. Um, I know that there's also probably many of you that don't know me, haven't met me yet. Our church has not only grown in the past year, but since we haven't been able to meet, I just haven't met many people. So I just want to give you a little bit about myself before I begin, like, you know, just bare minimum facts. Married to Phil, I have four kids. Here's a picture of them. They're very cute and I love them all dearly. Um, I love the color emerald green. I don't know why, just always have. I love turtles. I love Star Wars. Um, And I will always dress in a theme. So if you invite me to a party, something, I'm going to be matching whatever the color scheme is. Um, I also don't like small talk. And I don't know if this is because I'm an introvert or what, but I feel like when I am talking to someone and there's like icebreakers, which I know is ironic because we literally have icebreakers for you tonight. But to me, I feel like relational ice is pretty thick when I meet someone. And so like to just come up with like, what do you do for a living? Or like, how was your week? Just feels like a very, like a scratch in the ice. Like I need a big icebreaker. If I had my druthers, Every icebreaker at every women's event, which I'm not allowed to do this, so don't worry, but it would be like, hey, when's the last time your tampon leaked into your pants? Because we all want to say it was high school, but we all know it was like two months ago. Or like, um, how long does your chin hair have to grow before you pluck it? Because mine's about every three weeks and it just jumps out of nowhere. It's like, it's not there, it's not there. It's half an inch long. So to me, those are the kind of icebreakers. And don't worry, we didn't have you ask those questions. But like, if you meet me and we get to talking, I hope I get to learn something about, I don't know, maybe your facial hair or something that's big enough to break the ice. So just know that that's another thing about me. Hopefully the questions tonight are a little more tame. Um, And so if I did sit with you, One of the things I know I would like to talk to you about is just your 2020, how it was for you. Was it hard? What parts were easy? Was there any life in it? Was there any tragedy in it? We all faced something 
both good and bad, I think, in 2020. And I'd be just fascinated to hear uh, some of your stories. But uh, tonight, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, something God's been teaching me and what, what he taught me in 2020. So as you know, quarantine last year happened. I remember I was in Hawaii. It was March 14th because it was my son's birthday. We're flying home from Hawaii. And so we flew to Hawaii without even hearing about the coronavirus, except maybe a little bit passing in the news. We flew home to the world had shut down. My kids didn't go back to school from that point on. We had to, you know, we didn't have Sunday services from that Sunday on. And it was just like night and day. And for the first month, I was like, I am killing this. I was made for quarantine. Because first of all, when you're a mom with kids in preschool or even elementary school, maybe more older, I don't have older kids, so I don't really know. But the end of the year is like the major hustle time because you have graduation parties, you have Mother's Day stuff, you have Father's Day stuff, you have teacher appreciation, you have spirit week, you have pajama day, you have bike day. I mean, it's just like the April and May of school is the most tiring months of the year. So just have that completely canceled. There was some sadness and grieving over what I missed and what I missed with my kids, but mostly I was like, oh, we don't have anything for so long, Phil. We can just sit at home for so long. He was home on Sundays because he was recording on Thursdays. It was awesome. I just felt like this is, I was made for this. I can do this really well. But about a month in, I started to like feel like, I, like my lungs. I didn't know how to describe it. And I was like, babe, what if I have COVID? I don't know. I haven't been around, but I, you know, I go grocery shopping. And so I'm typing in all of the, you know, this is so early on I'm typing in all of the symptoms and I'm like, okay, I don't have a fever. I haven't lost my taste and smell, but like, I kept being like, okay, I have to breathe in really deep. And I, I just told him, I was like, I feel like when you're in a sauna and you can like feel the air in your lungs because it's so humid. I'm like, I don't know how to describe it. I can just feel my lungs. And so then I'm like looking up walking pneumonia. I'm like, what if I have walking pneumonia? I can't go to the hospital during COVID. Obviously, I don't want to be around it if I don't have it and they won't admit me. And I can't just get a test because it's so early on. So I'm like, I'm just going to monitor these symptoms. But for about a month, I was like, I might have COVID. It's just a, I don't know what to do about this. I don't want to be around people. So one day I'm sitting on the couch and um, my kids are running around. You know, they've been out of school for a month. We haven't seen anyone. We haven't gone anywhere, really. And um, my then three-year-old Cyrus crawls up onto my lap. And my COVID, like, overwhelms me. And I'm, like, taking deep breaths. I'm like, oh, my gosh. And it hit me that I didn't have COVID or walking pneumonia. I just had anxiety. And all this time that I thought I was dealing so well with quarantine, my body was like, I actually hate this and I'm trying to get your attention. And I'm like thinking that I have some disease because I just had never experienced the physical aspect of anxiety before. And you know, it just took like the 10 millionth touch for me to be like, oh, that's what I'm feeling. And I hate this feeling. So that's something I learned in 2020, what anxiety feels like and also what pushes me over the edge, which is apparently my kids home all day, all the time. Sorry, guys. I love you. Um, and so another thing, and more importantly, what I learned is that Jesus started talking to me about my identity. And I don't know if you've gotten prophetic words in the past or if God gives you pictures and there's a theme in them. I just want to tell you if there is a theme that you see in what people pray over you or the, the things that move you in movies or music, pay attention to that theme because it is almost always attached to some form of identity that he wants to give you. And so the Lord has always used like warrior imagery in my life. Um, I joke all the time, you know that phrase, I'm a lover, not a fighter. I joke with Phil, like I'm a fighter, not a lover. And it, it's interesting because I'm not very aggressive. I am uh, certainly not very competitive. And all these things that you would think come with the warrior like aren't actually part of my personality, but it is always the imagery that the Lord uses to call me to things. And when I was a youth pastor, all of the girls and a lot of the youth leaders who were girls were reading the Twilight series. And I had no interest in reading it, but I was like, I'm just going to read it to see what's going on, to see why they like it, and mostly to see this thing that was basically discipling our young girls into their ideas of, you know, love and relationships. And so I read all the series and I haven't reread them. So if you're a huge Twilight fan and I miss a detail, please feel free to let me know. Maybe I should go back and read this picture, but there was this one scene in the end of the third book, or I think, and the main character, one of her powers or gifts is that she can block people from reading her mind. The vampires can read people's minds, but they can't read hers. It's a thing. So she learns as she grows in this gifting that she actually can expand this gift over 
people around her to protect her. And in the, this last battle scene, she's like crouched before her whole family and everyone on her side of the battlefield. And she has to like get this, like deep down, this willingness to like cover and this strength. And she's able to cover everyone on her side, everyone in her army um, and, and protect them. And, you know, I had, just was reading the books for like, basically due diligence as a youth pastor, but the Lord, like in that picture, I feel like the Lord was like, this is who you are. And I didn't have kids yet. I didn't have very many people to protect, but I've always held on to that picture of like this army behind me and there's something I am doing to protect them. And um, that's just always stood out with me. Um, I was at a retreat one time and just having kind of one of those have it out with Jesus moments where I'm praying and like, I need a word from you. I'm always giving people words and I need a word from you. And he said to me, like, stop talking. The next thing you hear is your word for you. And I had this song on in the background. And so I stopped and I'm like, what is it? And um, it's a song by Alanis Morissette. And she says, I am a Joan of Arc and smart enough to believe this. And it was like, you know, when the word of the Lord just hits you right to the heart, like a Joan of Arc. So I went and I read about her and her life and this young warrior who led an army of people who didn't even really believe what she was saying. They just saw that she had, you know, victory on her side. Um, he gave me a picture once where I'm just sitting in my armor on a couch and he was like, you have your armor on, it's time to stand up. Like reluctantly, like, okay, it's time to stand up. So time after time after time in my life, the Lord's just shown me this warrior imagery. Um, and so at the end of 2020, we, I did a cohort with our denomination Foursquare. One of the things they wanted us to do is to come up with like an identity statement, like I am blank. And so we worked for it on months and like we met with coaches and there's other things going on, but this is one of like the highlights of the cohort is to come out on the other side with this identity statement. And so I was thinking about all these warrior images that God had given me, trying to stay humble and not be like, hmm, I'm a warrior. It just feels very like, I don't know, self-promoting to me at least. And I couldn't really come up with a succinct image or a succinct phrase. And so I called Gretchen, who some of you might know, she was the leader of the cohort. And I was just like, okay, Gretchen, here's what I'm feeling from God. Here's what I've prayed over, blah, 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 blah. And I talked for like five to 10 minutes straight. This is what I think, this is what I have, blah, blah, blah. And she's quiet on the other end. And she goes, okay, well, here's what I heard. And she read it and she goes, I am a warrior of truth and beauty. And I'm listening to that. And there's this part in me that's like, that's everything I want to be. Like if I died, if people were like, hey, tell me about Emily. And they're like, ah, she was a warrior of truth and beauty. I would be like, yes. Like it was so perfectly suited for what I had been feeling that I was brought to tears. But here's the only thing that was wrong with it. I said, I just thought it was too good for me. I was like, oh, that's, how could I possibly actually be this thing that I would love to be? I don't feel like I'm good enough for it. I don't feel like I carry enough for it. I don't feel like that's how God really sees me. And so I'd ask myself like, why do I feel like I am not worthy of this title? Gretchen made me keep it. I had to have it printed out by my bed at the retreat and stuff. So I'm leaning into it. But, but the problem wasn't that I didn't feel like it was for me. The problem was I didn't feel like I deserved it. And I wonder how many of us have words of the Lord over us, or even if we have to do the hard work of distilling what it is, that we think, I wish I could be what he says I am, but I don't think I deserve it. In Genesis 2, we have this beautiful picture of a calling for all women. And I'm going to just talk about it briefly. And um, I want you to listen to the truth in this, because this isn't what I think, and this isn't what someone has made up. This is what the word of God says. It's what Jesus thinks about you. And it is in Genesis 2. In 2.18, the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So the purpose of a woman being a woman is being a helper. Now, ooh, that word sits so badly with us because it just almost automatically denotes submission or not as good as, or coming alongside in a secondary role, right? But the beauty of the actual Hebrew word here is 
life changing. If that's how you feel about being a helper, let me tell you what God feels about being a helper. The word for helper is etzer, E-Z-E-R. And this word etzer is used tons of times in the Old Testament. So we actually know really specifically what it means. So it's used in Genesis twice to describe the woman. It's used uh, in a few other places to describe other countries or nations that Israel has gone to for help. Um, in Isaiah 30, Israel turns to Egypt and the Lord goes, if you turn to Egypt, they will not be the help that you need them to be. Like Israel's like, hey, there's a king coming after us. I'm going to turn to Egypt for their chariots and their horses and their wealth to help me fight this other army and not to God. And God's like, it won't be the helper. Um, in Ezekiel, it's a prophecy that God is saying through Ezekiel that the king of Jerusalem will be taken away into Babylon and his helpers, his aides, his military aid from other countries won't be able to stop it. And then in Daniel, um, it's talking about, it's another prophecy about uh, the Seleucid dynasty that's going to come against Jerusalem. And he says that there will be no help in that day. And so at there in all of these contexts, talking about Israel and other nations is very specifically a military help. It is not like, help me get out of the, I broke, twisted my ankle, please help me get to the hospital. Like it's a military help coming, a stronger army coming to save a weaker army who needs, who needs help. And then we have it uh, about God, that God is Israel's helper. And that's the rest of the verses in Exodus uh, it says, the God of my father is my help who delivered me from Egypt. Deuteronomy 33 talks about um, the, the blessings of God and the help in the time of war, that God will be the help. And then it's all over Psalms. God is my help and my shield. God is my help and my strength. God is my help and my deliverer. And so what is common in about all these Bible verses past Genesis is it's always talking about a military aid, a military aid that is intended to save and deliver. And this is the word the Lord uses of women. Our purpose is to be a military aid strong enough to come save and deliver. Our strength, your strength is necessary to win the battles that the Lord has called the church to. And of course, to me, this is so meaningful because of this identity I feel like the Lord has put on my life. But I even kind of vacillated whether to share this because I'm like, Lord, if, if it took me a year of a cohort and training and a coaching and years and years of prophetic words over me to get to this idea of warrior, that it's so intimate, it's so personal for me, surely it isn't that intimate and that personal for all these women I'm going to be speaking to. I'm talking to a group of women that there's no way that the warrior imagery is as strong for them. I believe that the military aid, the one that helps and delivers the strength that comes alongside when something isn't strong enough to save itself is for all women. But I don't feel like there's this army of warriors out there that I'm talking to. And the Lord said, you aren't talking to an army of warriors. You are talking to an army of women. And that is the difference. We aren't all warriors. Some of you might be dreamers. You might be an exhorter. We're gardeners, we're writers, we're singers, we're worshipers, we're dancers, we're intercessors, we're doulas. We are sisters and mothers and daughters. We're leaders, we're servants, we're poets, we're designers, we're architects, we're standard bearers. We are prophets and shepherds and evangelists and prophets and teachers. That's who I'm talking to. If you are listening to this, if you go to the square, if you're under the calling of this house, and if you are a woman, you are in an army and God wants you to find your place. We're not an army of warriors. We're not an army of Emily's. We're not an army of all the same. We are an army of women and that is even Better. We are a strong military aid coming to fight in a battle that can't be won without us. It can't be won without you. So there's three things I want you to consider being a part of an army of women. First of all, we have to be excellently skilled in our weapon. So we went to Disney World and... Um, if you think that I don't have a $200 lightsaber in my house, uh, think again! But this thing, it's a weapon, right? 
And just because I own it, just because I have it, just because I can turn it on, doesn't know I mean in, I know anything about how to use it, how to defend, how to attack. Honestly, this thing is kind of too heavy for me to hold with my forearm strength, right? And so we have this weapon, and Ephesians tells us that uh, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. So we know that the Bible is our weapon, but I would go even further to say that it is our words, the words in general of the Lord that are our weapon. Just because we can speak them doesn't know we know how doesn't mean we know how to wield them. Right? The the prophetic words the Lord gives you, are you sharing them? Your Bible, do you know how to read it? The words that you speak out, are you encouraging instead of gossiping? When you think about the enemy who tempts Jesus in the wilderness. He uses not only words, but he uses the word of God. Here's the thing. The enemy knows how to use his weapon really, really well. Jesus knew how to use it better. Do we know how to use our weapon better than the enemy knows? So that's the first thing. Know your weapon, know how to use it. And it's not just the Bible. It's all the words of God that come through you to bring life to other people. Secondly, being in an army means we leave no woman behind. And I've never been in armed services, so Kathy Seibert, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that this idea of leaving no man behind is in almost every creed of every armed service branch of the United States. There is something about being in an army that expands to this, like, not just we're friends, not just we love each other, not just we see each other on Sunday, but there's something about, like, we have a camaraderie uh, that binds us together. And so I just want you to, this group that you're sitting with, there's only six of you. Listen, all of you have different needs. All of you have different desires. Some of you might not want to make any new friends because you're overwhelmed by people. Some of you might be desperate to make new friends. Some of you might be, you know, like extroverts. Some of you might be introverts. All the needs at your table are going to be different. But here's what God promises. All of the needs at your table will be able to be met by the family of God. Doesn't mean necessarily those six people around you, but like in the square, in the women's group, in this army, whatever your need is, God promises will be able to be met here. And so you have to share it, share your need, get as vulnerable as you feel. And if you are at the table and you are feeling called to care for and love someone, do it. Like, let's not let any woman be left behind. Let's not let any woman who walks in on a Sunday morning or walks into a women's event feel like she wasn't seen, she wasn't loved, and she wasn't known. And that's on all of us. Share your needs, fill someone else's needs. Let's have a camaraderie that is like mind blowing to the world. Like I'm never worried about food. I'm never worried about clothing. I'm never worried about housing. I'm never worried about emotional well-being. I'm never worried about any of these things because I know I can take my needs to my sisters and through Jesus and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and the love that we have for each other, we're going to be able to meet these needs. And thirdly, being part of an army means you know the heart of your king. Because we know we're not in a battle against flesh and blood. We're in a battle against the principalities and the spiritual world. And so we are in a battle. We are an army for the kingdom of God. And we are led by a good and gracious king who knows when we lie down and when we rise up. He knows the hearts of all. He knows what is out there. He knows where he's called us. He knows your identity. He created it. He's speaking it into. You have to know the heart of your king. Um... He's placed you in this city, in this time, in your body, with your heart and your mind and your soul. And he's intentional about all of that. So get to know the heart of your king. Be in your secret place with Jesus. Ask him, who am I and where do I belong in this army of women? Because the scriptures, as we saw, are full of places where God says, "Uh uh-uh, that it's there won't help you because it's not centered in me. That it's there isn't getting its strength from me. So you're in Etzer. Where are you getting your strength from? How will you come alongside to help people if you are not being filled by the strength of God? He is the true Etzer, and he empowers us in all of our battles. So all of you should have little papers um, on your table. And this process for me certainly wasn't overnight. I explained, you know, different things I had to go through. And so I'm not saying this will be easy for you. And I don't even think this is a formula that everyone has to follow. But it was powerful to me, so I wanted to give you guys a tool to work on tonight or to take home tonight. And this paper says, I am a blank of blank and blank. And again, it's not a formula. If that's just a jumping off point for you, take it. Maybe you know exactly what you, like maybe God's been speaking to you and you're like, 
this is what he says I am. Maybe it's something you talk around your table. Like, hey, for those of you who know me or for those of you who just met me tonight, like, do you have any sense from the Lord of like what he's calling me into and see if it lines up with the other things God has told you. Maybe you'll be able to fill it out tonight. Maybe it'll stay in your Bible for a year as a little bookmark. And every time you see it, you go, ah, oh, Jesus, what, what do you see me as? What is my identity? Like, what kind of etzer am I? I'm a woman, so I'm an etzer. What kind am I? And where do I belong in this army? Uh, at one of our first women's events ever, I got up at the end to close and I just said, I feel like the Lord is saying, if we put our ear to the ground, we will hear the rumblings of the footsteps of an army of women coming. And there weren't very many people in the room um, and it didn't even resonate with me, but I was very sure that it was a word from the Lord. And honestly, I haven't thought about that word maybe once or twice in the past three years. But I felt like today, the Lord's like, that word was from right now. The army is here. The sisterhood is here. Every woman has an identity and a place. And it is impossible for the square to do what it is called to do without you being all in with what God has asked you to do in your family and your context. It will not look like someone else's. The beauty of the individuality is that it is specifically needed for a specific purpose and place and time. So the army's here, guys. You have an assignment. Find out what it is from the Lord. And together with the rest of the church of God, we can enter into the fight for Smyrna. So let's partner with each other and let's partner with God for the renewal of our city. Love you. I mean, we have a lead pastor who wears camo and carries a lightsaber. I mean, what could be better? <laughs> Seriously, I am so grateful for that word, for that encouragement. Um, specifically, I just really hope that you have time to process both tonight and going forward. If there is anything that the Lord has called, is calling you to, that you think is too good for you. That is like a, that pierced me. And I think I'm not the only one. So talk about that at your tables. Brainstorm what your identity statement could be. We have those papers for you. And um, just carry it. Put it in your Bible. Put it in a frame next to your bed to look at every morning if you fill it with some words. Um, and I would love for you to share it. Share it with our community. You can put it on social media. You can email me um, and we may collect them all. I would love to have a list of the members of our army here at the square. So I can't wait. Enjoy the rest of your food. Enjoy the rest of your night. And uh, please know that you are loved.